So, short-term memory. <coughs> There's your textbook definition. Memory system with limited storage capacity in which information is stored for a relatively short period of time unless renewed in some way. So unless revisited or changed in some way. Okay. So remember the sensory memory had almost an unlimited capacity because there's so much information coming in. That's like the first, the first level. The second level is where we want to only deal with stuff that we think is important. Okay, so short-term memory stores information longer than sensory memory, um, but it doesn't store it for as long as long-term memory. And what we need to remember is, is that information only enters our short-term memory if we attend to it, if we pay attention to it. Okay, so right now, you're paying attention to what I'm saying. Okay, therefore the words that I'm saying, most of them are entering short-term memory. Okay. So the information has been encoded. You can understand the words that I'm saying. You're listening to them. Your brain is working hard to make sure that you hold on to these words that I'm saying. Okay? And as it says there down the bottom, it holds all the info we are consciously aware of at any given time. How long does it last for? Well, short-term memory lasts for about 12 seconds. Okay? So that's important to note down. Um, after that 12 seconds, you've got probably another six or so seconds where the information that's in there decreases. So if you don't pay any attention to it, if you don't repeat it, uh, or if new information comes in in that time, then it can fall out. Okay. Um, after 18 seconds, as it says there, information is pretty much forgotten. Um, also, if you are distracted during this time, that also will um, stop, or not stop, but it will hinder the ability for you to remember the words you've left in short-term memory or, any, or the information you've left in short-term memory. So, for example, what I'd like you to do um, is I want you to just listen to these following numbers. I don't want you to write them down yet, I just want you to listen to them. So, I want you to remember the following numbers. 7, 2, 9, 4, 1, 8, 3. Okay, I want you to write those numbers down now. Hopefully, you remembered all of them, or at least most of them, okay? Um, and I'm going to give you another set of numbers now, and I want you to do exactly the same thing, okay? So, listen up. 4, 9, 1, 7, 3, 8, 6, 2, Nine, five, seven. Okay, write them down now too. All right, so let's check how you went. First time round, you should have had the numbers seven, two, nine, four, one, eight, and three. Hopefully, you got most of those because there is seven numbers there. So you should have remembered most of those. With the second lot of numbers, check how you went, you should have had four, nine, one, seven, three, eight, six, two, nine, five, and seven. Hopefully you were ticking a few of those off. You may notice that in the second bunch of numbers, you didn't get as many correct, okay? That's fine, it's completely normal. As you can see from our slide here, that most people, the average number of items that the average person can remember is about seven items in your short-term memory. So you can really only remember about seven things at once that you can hold in your memory. Some people can hold on to a couple more, so about nine. 
some people a couple less, about five. But as a general rule, we think of it as the capacity of short-term memory is about seven plus or minus two items of information. Interesting, interestingly enough, a bit like Homer Simpson, um, when the short-term memory is full, okay, if you learn something new, it pushes something else out. Okay, so you can't hold any more in your any more items in your short-term memory than is your capacity, which is usually about seven plus or minus two. Okay, so if you've got that seven in there, and that's that's your limit, if you put one other new piece of information in, the old piece of information drops out. Okay, so. When we're dealing with short-term memory, information is mostly lost through decay, because you don't rehearse it, or displacement, being pushed out. So how do we get through life without dealing with only seven pieces of information? Well, our brains will automatically try and chunk that information together, so we have more information for the one value. Notice it didn't say seven words or it didn't say seven letters or seven numbers it said seven items okay so chunking is a process that we use you can see the definition there grouping separate bits of information into a larger single unit for information and this allows us to put more information in or hold more information into our short-term memory so for example have a look at those letters So there's more letters there than we can hold in our short-term memory. Okay, so if we had to remember those, we would struggle, we would lose a few. But if we were to chunk them like this, we'd be very we'd be able to hold them in there for as long as we needed to. Okay, so we have what we've done there is we've taken those letters, okay, those 12 letters, and we've condensed them into four items. So now we can hold all of those letters in our short-term memory because they're in small chunks. Okay, so that's a very valuable technique that we use. You will use this um, if you think of your mobile phone number or think of your best friend's mobile phone number. Okay, that's about nine numbers. You don't usually remember that as all single numbers. You use numbers. how many? Ten numbers. Ten numbers. I've been told it's ten numbers. You won't use them all at once. Okay, you'll usually say it's 0409, that's the first chunk, or 040. And then you'll chunk it differently. So 0409 632 217. That's easier to remember because that's only three chunks rather than 10 separate items. Okay? Okay. Okay, so once you've got the chunking down, then to hold it in your short term memory or to move it from short term memory to long term memory, we have to engage in a process called rehearsal. Okay, so rehearsal, as you can see there, is the process of manipulating information to keep it in short-term memory or to transfer it to long-term memory. This will aid in storage and retrieval. So once you have your chunk, like your phone number, okay, and you've taken it from 10 numbers to three chunks of numbers, okay, then it's easier for you to hold on to that phone number or to, or to put that phone number in your long-term memory if you rehearse it, okay? So there's two types of rehearsal. There's maintenance rehearsal and elaborative rehearsal. So maintenance rehearsal is the really simple one. This is, you know, if someone tells you a phone number or the combination to their lock, you know, and they say, um, my phone number is 0409 635 235. Then what you'll probably do, if you don't have a pen on you or you don't have your phone on you, you'll say 0409 235 625. 635. 635, whatever the number is. And you'll say it over and over and over in your head. This is special guest commentary from <laughs> Dr. Lauren over here behind us. Um, so you'll say it over and over and over in your head. What that does, that's called rote learning, but we call it, in this case, we're calling it maintenance rehearsal. Okay? And it's simple repetition. All right? Sometimes you guys will do this with definitions. You'll write down the definition once, twice, three times, or say it over in your head, that kind of idea. You'll notice the point down the bottom, this is not terribly effective for encoding information to be transferred into long-term memory. It's not super duper effective. There are better ways. It's a very basic way to keep information for a short amount of time. 
okay? But it will decay if you don't have some other information to attach it to. And that's where elaborative rehearsal comes in, okay? We do this in class all the time. So linking new information in a meaningful way with information already stored in long-term memory to aid in its storage and retrieval from long-term memory. This focuses on the meaning of the information, okay? The more links you make, the more likely you are to remember it. Um, also, if you can connect it to something about you, okay, so what we call a self-reference relating to new information, then it's more likely to stay encoded in your long-term memory. Um, and also, it's more effective than maintenance rehearsal as it helps with encoding. So, for example, you will know that sometimes when I talk about phobias in class, okay, I will always use the example of people that are scared of dogs. Okay, I use that example because I know that there are people in the room that will be able to connect what I'm saying about phobias or fear. Okay, they'll be able to connect it to themselves because they have a certain fear of dogs, which most of them got over when we brought Jess into class anyway, but that doesn't matter. The point is, is that the more information that we can connect to ourselves or the more information we can connect to, to memories that we already have, the more likely it is to stick. That's why we use examples as often as we can. Okay, that's why in class at times I get you to move around the room. So when we were doing the split brain information and we did the activity in class where you had to be a partner with someone, the idea is there is that rather than just reading it and trying to maintenance rehearse it, you will be able to connect split brain with that activity and you'll be able to picture in your mind who you were partnered with, what things that you were able to do, what things your partner was was or was not able to do, okay? And so you have four different pieces of information that you can use together now to remember what it was to have a split brain procedure, okay? And that's what we talk about when we're talking about elaborative rehearsal. So in summary, in a nice little visual here, you can see the multi-store model has three different sections, sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory, okay? If we do not attend to something in our sensory memory, then we lose it, it, it falls out, it goes away. If we do attend to that information in our sensory information, like you're attending now to my voice or to the visuals on the screen, it then goes into short-term or working memory. If we do not rehearse it, or we do not encode it, okay, then it drops out of our working memory, okay. If we do rehearse it, we can use maintenance rehearsal, and maintenance rehearsal will keep it in our short-term memory, or we can use elaborative rehearsal. The elaborative rehearsal will work better in encoding it and storing it in our long-term memory, and then any information that's in our long-term memory, ideally, we can bring that forward from long-term memory to short-term memory so we can work with it, okay? And that's the last thing I'm gonna to talk to you about right now is the idea of short-term memory as working memory. So, you can see here, initially it was called short-term memory because it was short-term, we only used it very briefly. As more research has been done, we've come to think of it as working memory, a place where we can work with it, okay? We can work with sensory information and we can work with long-term memory and we can combine them and use the short-term memory information that we're just dealing with now and we can manipulate it, send it off to long-term memory or discard it. So here it says working memory emphasizes the active part of memory where info we are consciously aware of is actively worked on in various ways. So we consciously use information from sensory memory and long-term memory and it provides a workspace for us currently being used for some conscious cognitive activity. Think of it like this, okay? If we go back to the start of this video, we were talking about memory as a computer, okay? The cognitive perspective. Short-term memory is like now, okay, is like your desktop computer, okay? Or it's like your computer screen, okay? Long-term memory is like the hard drive or the external hard drive. Sorry. Sensory memory is like the keyboard, okay? 
So what you're doing is, if you are on your keyboard, you're typing information into your computer. It appears on your screen, okay? That is like you paying attention to something in your sensory register. So you've paid attention to it, now it comes into your working memory, the same way it would appear on your screen. If you think it's important on your screen and you want to save it, then you will click save. Once you save it, it goes to your long-term memory. The same way as if you save it, it will go to your hard drive. Okay. If you're working on a document in your short-term memory or your working memory and you need some other information, you might go to your hard drive and open another document. The same thing works here. If you are working in short-term memory or working memory, okay, and you need some other information, another memory about a name or a place or something like that, then you will go and retrieve it from your long-term memory and you will bring it forward to your working memory. Same way you will open a document and it will appear on your screen. Okay, so that's the best way to understand short-term memory or as it's now more popularly known as working memory. Imagine it like the computer screen that you're looking at now. Okay, so we revisit this idea again. You have three structures of memory. Okay, you have sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Okay, if you don't pay attention to something in your sensory memory, then it disappears. If you do pay attention to something in your sensory memory, it will then be held in short-term memory. If you don't rehearse information in short-term memory, then it disappears. If you do rehearse it, then it can either stay in your short-term memory or be transferred to long-term memory. Once the information is in long-term memory, then most of the time it will stay there. Remember, I've given the analogy to some kids in class about the rubbish bins. All right, We will learn about long-term memory in another video. I don't want to overload you with this just now. But what you need to know is that there are three levels here, okay? And it's very important. So the atkinson triffin model, the multi-model of, sorry, the multi-store model has these three models, okay? So I hope that um, gives you some understanding of introduction to memory, okay? We'll continue to go through. There'll be some more videos. Some activities that I suggest you do, um, just as some revision, because what you want to do is you want to take the information that is now in your short-term memory and you want to encode it into long-term memory. To do that, we want to use elaborative rehearsal. So, after you've finished watching this video, do learning activity 6.2 in your textbook, which is on page 292, okay? Then I want you to do learning activity 6.3 and learning activity 6.6. .6. Okay, so if you do those, then you will be better off. And if you're really feeling up to it, try learning activity 6.7. Okay, so that's part of your elaborative rehearsal to get the information from short term memory into long term memory. All right. Please, while you're doing this, write down any questions about anything you don't understand. Make sure you ask me during class time or um, ask it on the Facebook or via email. Okay? Um, I will see you in class. See you later.